opposition. I now call the Chancellor of the Exchequer, the Right Honourable George Osborne. Mr Deputy Speaker, this is a budget for people who aspire to work hard and get on. It's a budget for people who realise there are no easy answers to problems built up over many years, just the painstaking work of putting right what went so badly wrong. And together with the British people, we are slowly but surely fixing our country's economic problems. We've now cut the deficit, not by a quarter, but by a third. We've helped business create not a million new jobs, but one and a quarter million new jobs. We've kept interest rates at record lows. But, Mr Deputy Speaker, despite the progress we've made, there's much more to do. And today I'm going to level with people about the difficult economic circumstances we still face and the hard decisions required to deal with them. It is taking longer than anyone hoped, but we must hold to the right track. And by setting free the aspirations of this nation, we will get there. Our economic plan combines monetary activism with fiscal responsibility and supply-side reform. And today, we go further on all three components of that plan, monetary, fiscal and supply-side reform. But we also understand something else more fundamental. Our nation is in a global race, competing alongside new centres of enterprise around the world for investment and jobs that can move anywhere. And what was the response of those who came before us? to expand the state in a way we couldn't afford, to drive businesses overseas with taxes that became more and more uncompetitive, (laughs) to let schools fail, to deplete our skills base, let a bloated welfare system pick up the human casualties and assume that an uncontrolled banking boom would pick up the bill. To win in the global race, we are doing the exact opposite building a modern, reformed state that we can afford, bringing businesses to our shores with competitive taxes, fixing the banks, improving our schools, our skills. Order, order, order. Obviously, the country is waiting to hear the Chancellor. I certainly want to hear the Chancellor. I'm sure most of the people in this chamber also want to hear the Chancellor. Please, let's hear the Chancellor. George Osborne. For years, Mr Deputy Speaker, people have felt that the whole system was tilted against those who did the right thing, who worked, who saved, who aspired. These are the very people we must support if Britain is to have a prosperous future. This is a budget for those who aspire to own their own home, who aspire to get their first job or start their own business, a budget for those who want to save for their retirement and provide for their children. It is a budget for our aspiration nation. Mr Deputy Speaker, the forecast from the Independent Office for Budget Responsibility today reminds us of the economic challenge at home and abroad. But it also... The shadow... Order! Order! Let's start off as we mean to go on. Now, the shadow Chancellor may not have been the Chancellor, but he should have the courtesies and should know better than actually. We want no advice from the government. should know better than to display it. I don't wish to see it. Otherwise, it is not a good position to put us in. And let us continue, and let's not this become a circus of the day. George Osborne. Mr Deputy Speaker. Since the autumn statement, the OBR has revised down again its forecast for global economic growth and sharply revised down its forecast for world trade. Growth in the US and Japan was flat in the last quarter, while the Eurozone shrank by 0.6%, the largest fall since the height of the financial crisis. The problems in Cyprus this week are further evidence that the crisis is not over and the situation remains very worrying. 
I can confirm, as the Prime Minister said, that people sent to Cyprus to serve our country in our military or government will be protected in full from any tax on their deposit. And the OBR have today sharply revised down their future growth forecast for the Eurozone and expect it will remain in recession throughout this year. In their words, the underlying situation in the Eurozone remains very fragile. And I will be straight with the country. Another bout of economic storms in the Eurozone would hit Britain's economic fortunes hard. 40% of all we export, we export to the Eurozone. There is a huge effort across this government to grow Britain's trade with the fast-growing parts of the world. And exports to Brazil, India and China are up by almost two-thirds. UK firms now export more goods to non-EU countries than to EU countries. The first time this has happened in over two decades. But we are still very exposed to what happens on the continent. Indeed, last year, domestic demand was actually stronger than forecast. But it was the weakness of net trade that helps account for much of the weakness in GDP. As the OBR makes clear, the unexpectedly poor performance of exports is more than sufficient on its own to explain the shortfall. GDP for last year has turned out to be a little higher than the OBR forecast in December, but this year their output forecast is reduced to 0.6% growth. And despite the recession in the Eurozone, the OBR's central forecast today is that we avoid a second quarter of negative growth here in the UK. While less than we would like, our growth this year and next year is forecast by the IMF to be higher than France and Germany. It is a reminder that all Western nations live in very challenging economic times. And the OBR then expect the recovery to pick up to 1.8% in 2014, 2.3% 2 in 2015, 2.7% in 2016 and 2.8% in 2017. Crucially, jobs are being created. Indeed, in the words of the OBR, the picture on employment continues to surprise on the upside in this forecast. Mr Deputy Speaker, when we started the unavoidable task of reducing the size of the public sector workforce, some in the House expressed doubts that the private sector would be able to make up the difference. And I'm glad to report to the House that their lack of confidence in British businesses has been misplaced. It is a tribute to the energy and enterprise of British companies that for every one job lost in the public sector in the last year, six jobs have been created in the private sector. The employment rate has been growing faster than in the US and three times as fast as in Germany. And so despite the weaker GDP, at this budget the OBR have now revised up further their forecast for employment. Compared to this time last year, the OBR now expect 600,000 more jobs in 2013, and there will be 60,000 fewer people claiming unemployment benefit. We've seen more people in work than ever before, including a record number of women, a quarter of a million fewer workless households than two years ago, and the unemployment rate is lower than when we came to office. Yeah. Mr Deputy Speaker. The deficit continues to come down. Three years ago, the government was borrowing one pound for every four it spent. That was completely reckless and unsustainable. We have taken many tough decisions to bring that deficit down, and we will continue to do so. The deficit has fallen from 11.2% of GDP in 2009-10 to a forecast of 7.4% this year. This is a fall of a third. It then falls further to 6.8% next year, 5.9% in 2014-15, 5% in 2015-16, then 3.4% the following year, reaching 2.2% by 2017-18. These numbers, Mr Deputy Speaker, all exclude the transfer of the Royal Mail Pension Fund to the Government, which reduces the deficit still further for this year alone. It is sometimes asserted in this House that borrowing has gone up under this government, and the facts show, as we've just seen again, and the facts show the opposite to be true. The previous government, the previous government borrowed. Order, 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 order. 
We can't have one side being told without the other. You don't, it's not a competition who can shout the loudest. Let's hear the Chancellor. If you don't want to hear your own Chancellor, I'm sure your constituents would understand if you lift to leave the chamber. I suggest nobody wants to leave the chamber. Let us continue. Chancellor of the Exchequer. Mr Deputy Speaker, the facts show the opposite to be true. The previous government borrowed £159 billion in its last year in office. This year, this government is forecast to borrow £114 billion. Pounds. That's not more borrowing, that's £45 billion pounds a year less borrowing. Borrowing then falls from £108 billion next year and falls again to £97 billion in 2014-15, then £87 billion in the last year of this Parliament, before falling again to £61 billion and £42 billion in the following two years. And to ensure complete transparency, the OBR published the numbers without the APF cash transfers, they show that on that measure too, borrowing is just forecast to fall. We have committed at the start of this Parliament to a fiscal mandate that said we would aim to balance the cyclically adjusted current budget over the following rolling five years. And I can confirm that the OBR says we are on course to meet our fiscal mandate and meet it one year early. However, the likelihood of meeting the supplementary debt target has deteriorated. Public sector net debt is forecast to be 75.9% of GDP this year, 79.2% next year, 82.6% the year after, 85.1% in 2015-16, 85.6% in the year after, before falling to 84.8% in 2017-18. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, in response, there are those who would want to cut much more than we are planning to and chase the debt target. I said in December that I thought that with the current weak economic conditions across Europe, that would be a mistake. We've got a plan to cut our structural deficit, and our country's credibility comes from delivering that plan, not altering it with every forecast. And that's why interest rates remain so low. Our judgment has since been supported by the IMF, the OECD, and the Governor of the Bank of England, and I don't propose to change that judgment three months later. Mr Deputy Speaker, I have also had representations of this budget for measures that would add £33 billion a year extra to borrowing on top of the figures I have announced. It is from people who seem to think that the way to borrow less is to borrow more, and they would return us to the double-digit deficits of the last Government and give us far and away one of the highest deficits in the Western world. That would pose a huge risk to the stability of the British economy, threaten a sharp rise in interest rates, and leave the burden of debts to our children and our grandchildren. And I will not take that gamble with the future of this country, especially when those representations came from the very same people whose previous gamble with our economy led to the mess we're clearing up in the first place. Mr Deputy Speaker, the spending reductions we promised have been more than delivered. Welfare reforms have been legislated for and are taking place. And here's a clear sign of progress. The proportion of national income spent by the state has fallen from 47.4% three years ago to 43.6% today, and it's on course to reach 40.5% at the end of the period. We've set out the deficit plan, and we're delivering that plan. And taken together, the measures I will announce today are fiscally neutral overall. Ask the British people, and they will tell you our problem as a country is not that we're taxed too little, but that the government spends too much. And I agree with them. So the tax cuts in this budget aren't borrowed, they are paid for. That's our way, and it's the only responsible way to lower taxes. Yeah. Mr Deputy Speaker, it's the central plank of our economic plan that a tough and credible fiscal policy creates the space for an active monetary policy. And recovering from the financial crisis has exposed the shortcomings of conventional monetary tools. We in Britain have had to innovate and develop new tools. So have other countries. And I confirm today that the asset purchase facility will remain in place for the coming year. 
We are now actively considering with the Bank of England whether there are potential extensions to the successful funding for lending scheme that will boost lending still further. And we're also setting out our plans for lending from our new business bank. But I want to make sure that an active monetary policy plays a full role in supporting the economy. So I am today setting out an updated remit for the Monetary Policy Committee. Alongside it, we're publishing a review of the monetary policy framework. This budget confirms the primacy of price stability and the inflation target in Britain's monetary policy framework. The updated remit reaffirms the inflation target as 2% as measured by the 12-month increase in the Consumer Prices Index. The target will apply at all times. But as we've seen over the last five years, low and stable inflation is a necessary but not sufficient condition for our prosperity. The new remit explicitly tasks the MPC with setting out clearly the trade-offs it has made in deciding how long it will be before inflation returns to target. To ensure a fuller communication between the Bank and the Treasury, I am changing the timing of the open letter system so that when inflation is above target, the Governor will write to me on the day the minutes of the next MPC meeting are published to allow for a more substantive exchange of views. The new remit also recognises that the Monetary Policy Committee may need to use unconventional monetary instruments to support the economy while keeping inflation stable. And it makes clear that the Committee may wish to issue explicit forward guidance, including using intermediate thresholds, in order to influence expectations on the future path of interest rates. For example, that is what the US Federal Reserve has now done, making a commitment to keep interest rates low while unemployment is high, provided inflation is not expected to rise too much. This can help the economy because it gives families planning their futures and businesses wondering whether to invest more confidence that interest rates will stay lower for longer. So I'm asking the Monetary Policy Committee to provide an assessment of how intermediate thresholds might work in Britain and to give that assessment in its August 2013 inflation report. That report will be the first issued under the governorship of Mark Carney. Whether intermediate thresholds are used will be an operational matter for the independent MPC and I can confirm Mervyn King and Mark Carney have both seen the new remit and they have both uh, agreed to it. Yeah, yeah. Mr Deputy Speaker, active monetary policy can only operate freely when securely anchored by credible fiscal policy. Yeah, yeah. That is the next component of our economic plan. We have instituted new public spending controls in government. When money is short, we make no excuses for the rigorous financial management we have run across Whitehall. Let me be clear with the House. This is one of the reasons why we've got forecast borrowing falling in this year and next. The traditional splurge of cash by departments at the end of the financial year just to get the money spent has to be curtailed. And thanks to the tough financial control of my right honourable friend, the Chief Secretary, government departments are forecast to underspend their budgets by more than £11 billion this year. If you want to bring borrowing down, then you have to control spending, and this is what we have done. <laughs> now, we want to ensure departments have budgets that are more closely aligned to what they actually spend. So both next year and the year after, we will reduce resource departmental expenditure limits by the equivalent to a 1% reduction for most departments. The schools and the health budget will remain protected because our promise to our NHS is a promise we will keep. <laughs> Local government and police allegations for 2013-14 have already been set out and will not be affected. We will also deliver in this coming year on this nation's long-standing commitment to the world's poorest to spend 0.7% of our national income on international development. <laughs> And we should all take pride, as I do, in this historic achievement for our country. Yeah. As previously, the DFID budget will be adjusted to ensure we don't spend more than 0.7 per cent. Mr Deputy Speaker, departmental budgets have yet to be set for the year 2015-16, which starts before the end of this Parliament. This will be done in the spending round that will be set out on the 26th of June. I said last autumn that we would require around £10 billion of savings from that spending round. 
I confirm today that we will instead be seeking an £11.5 billion of current savings. We've got to go on making difficult decisions so that Britain can live within its means. And because we make those decisions, we can get our deficit down and focus on our nation's economic priorities. Total managed expenditure for 2015-16 will be set at £745 billion. How the savings will be achieved will be a matter for the spending round, but existing protections apply. We're also taking steps to help all departments achieve the savings required. Together, my right honourable friends, the Chief Secretary and the Minister for the Cabinet Office have identified a further £5 billion of efficiency and savings and cutting the cost of administration can be made. This will go a huge way towards delivering the spending round in a way that saves money but protects services. So too will action on pay. The Government will extend the restraint on public sector pay for a further year by limiting increases to an average of up to 1% in 2015-16. This will apply to the civil service and workforces with pay review bodies. Local government and devolved administration budgets will be adjusted accordingly in the spending round. We will also seek substantial savings from what is called progression pay. These are the annual increases in the pay of some parts of the public sector. I think they are difficult to justify when others in the public sector and millions more in the private sector have seen pay frozen or even cut. I know that is tough, but it is fair. And in difficult times, with the inevitable trade-off between paying people more and saving jobs, we should put jobs first. <clears throat> Mr Deputy Speaker. <laughs> Mr Deputy Speaker, today is also the 10th anniversary of the start of the Iraq War and the awarding of a posthumous Victoria Cross to Lance Corporal James Ashworth this week reminds us of the courage and sacrifice that all who serve in our armed forces are still making to defend our country. So we will exempt our military from changes to progression pay. And we are also accepting in full from the 1st of May this year the armed forces pay review body's recommended increase in the so-called X-factor payment made to military personnel to recognise the particular sacrifices they make. And I can also announce that further awards from the LIBOR banking fines have gone to good military causes with money for combat stress to help veterans with mental health issues and funds for Christmas boxes for all our troops on operations this year and next. Those who have paid fines in our financial sector because they demonstrated the very worst of values are paying to support those in our armed forces who demonstrate the very best of British values. Mr Deputy Speaker, ultimately as a country we will not be able to spend more on the services we all value from our NHS to our armed forces, or invest in our infrastructure unless we go on tackling the growth of spending of welfare budgets. The public spending framework introduced by the previous government divided government spending into two halves, fixed departmental budgets and what's called annually managed expenditure, except in practice it was annually unmanaged expenditure. <laughs> and it includes almost the entire welfare budget, as well as items like debt interest and payments to the European Union. I can tell the House that according to the OBR forecast today, the European budget deal secured by my right honourable friend the Prime Minister has saved Britain a total of three and a half billion pounds. Yeah. We will now introduce a new limit on a significant proportion of annually managed expenditure. It will be set out in a way that allows the automatic stabilisers to operate, but will bring real control to areas of public spending that have been out of control. We will set out how more detail uh, on this works in the new, uh, in the, how this new spending limit works at the spending round in June. All decisions on welfare, pay and departments are tough and they affect many people. But if we didn't take them, then what is a difficult situation for them and for the whole country would be very much worse. Mr Deputy Speaker, active monetary policy and a responsible fiscal policy are two components of our economic plan. 
We also need supply-side reform to throw the full weight of our efforts behind the entrepreneurial forces in our society. Our fundamental overhaul of the planning laws are now helping homes to be built and businesses to expand. Our reforms of schools, universities and apprenticeships is probably the single most important long-term economic policy we're pursuing. Our support for European free trade agreements with India, Japan and the US is a priority of our foreign policy. And we're building the most competitive tax system in the world. But now we need to do more. First, we can provide the economy with the infrastructure it needs. We're already supporting the largest programme of investment in our railways since Victorian times and spending more on new roads than in a generation. We're giving Britain the fastest broadband and mobile telephony in Europe. And the Treasury is now writing guarantees to major projects from supporting the regeneration of the old Battersea power station site to building the new power stations of tomorrow. We've switched billions of pounds from current to capital spending since the spending review to mitigate the sharp decline set in train by the last government. But on existing plans, capital spending is still due to fall back in 2015-16, and I don't think, Mr Deputy Speaker, that is sensible. So by using our extra savings from government departments, we will boost our infrastructure plans by £3 billion a year from 2015-16. That's £15 billion of extra capital spending over the next decade. Because by investing in the economic arteries of this country, we will get growth flowing to every part of it. And, and Mr Deputy Speaker, public investment will now be higher on average as a percentage of our national income under our plans than it was in the whole period of the last Labour government. In June, we will set out long-term spending plans for that long-term capital budget. And we'll use the expertise of Paul Dighton, the man who delivered the Olympics and who now serves in the Treasury, to improve the capacity of Whitehall to deliver big projects and make greater use of independent advice. The second thing we can do to support enterprise is to give our great regional cities and other local areas much greater control over their economic destiny and back sectors that are a global success. Businesses have created more jobs in areas like the West Midlands in the first three years of this government than they did in the first ten years of the Labour government. <laughs> Private sector employment has been growing more quickly in the North East, the North West and Yorkshire than across the whole country. But we can do much more. So I accept Michael Heseltine's excellent idea of a single competitive pot of funding for local enterprise. I also fully endorse the report of Doug Richard to make the most of our apprenticeships. We have the second largest aerospace industry in the world. For the first time in 40 years, we manufacture for export more cars than we import. And our agritech business is at the global cutting edge. We're backing international success stories like this with 1.6 billion of long-term funding for the industrial strategy that my right honourable friend, the Business Secretary, launched this week. And today, we build on our new tax reliefs coming in this year for the creative industries like high-end television and animation with new support for our world-class visual effects sector. To help small firms, we'll increase by five-fold the value of government procurement budgets spent through the Small Business Research Initiative. We will fund the proposal to make growth vouchers available to small firms seeking advice on how to expand. And we're putting new controls on what regulators can charge and giving the pensions regulator a new requirement to have a regard for the growth prospects of employers. Mr Deputy Speaker, a vital sector for our economy and a cost of doing business for everyone is energy. And creating a low-carbon economy should be done in a way that creates jobs rather than costing them. The granting of planning permission yesterday at Hinkley Point was a major step forward for new nuclear. Today, with the help of my honourable friend, the Energy Minister, we're also announcing our intention to take two major carbon capture and storage projects to the next stage of development. Yeah. We'll support the manufacture of ultra-low emission vehicles in Britain with new tax incentives. And the Honourable Member for Stoke-on-Trent Central has argued passionately, and on that occasion in a non-partisan way, about the damage energy costs are doing to his city's famous ceramics industry. And he's persuaded me, so we will exempt from next year the industrial processes for that industry and some others from the climate change levy. <laughs> In the 
spending ram, we will provide support for energy intensive industries beyond 2015. For the North Sea, we will this year sign contracts for future decommissioning relief, the expectation of which is already increasing investment there. But I also want Britain to tap into new sources of low-cost energy like shale gas. So I am introducing a generous new tax regime, including a shale gas field allowance to promote early investment. And by the summer, new planning guidance will be available alongside specific proposals to allow local communities to benefit. Shale gas is part of the future and we will make it happen. Yeah. Mr Deputy Speaker, we can help companies grow and succeed by building infrastructure, backing local enterprises and supporting successful sectors. But nothing beats having the most competitive business tax system of any major economy in the world. And that is what this government set out to achieve. That is what we're delivering. The accountants KPMG do a survey of investors that ranks the most competitive tax regimes in the world. Three years ago, we were near the bottom of that table. Now we're at the top. But in this global race, we cannot stand still. So today, we step up the pace. Our Seed Enterprise Investment Scheme offers generous incentives to investors in startups. My honourable friend for Braintree and David Young have done a great job helping promote it around the country. They've asked me to extend the CGT holiday, and I will. Employee ownership helps create an enterprise culture. So we're making our new employee shareholder status more generous with NICS and income tax relief. And we're introducing capital gains tax relief for sales of businesses to their employees. Companies that look after their employees and help them return to work after periods of sickness will get new help through the tax system too. And we're going to double to £10,000 the size of the loans that employers can offer tax-free to pay for items such as season tickets for commuters. This is a great idea from my honourable friend from Whitham, and uh, I'm happy to put into practice. And my honourable friend from Enfield North and others have put forward proposals to help investment in social enterprises. I've listened, and we will introduce a new tax relief to encourage private investment in these social enterprises. Research and development is absolutely central to Britain's economic future, so today I'm increasing the rates of the above-the-line R&D credit to 10 per cent, along with our new 10 per cent corporation tax rate on profits from patents coming in next month. This will help make us one of the most internationally attractive places to innovate. I also want Britain to be the place where people raise money and invest. Financial services are about much more than banking. And in places like Edinburgh and London, we have a world-beating asset management industry. But they're losing business to other places in Europe. We act now with a package of measures to reverse this decline. And we will abolish the Schedule 19 tax, which is only payable by UK domiciled funds. Many medium-sized firms and startups use the alternative investment market to raise funds to help them grow. Many observers of the British tax system complain that it has been long biased towards debt financing over equity investment. So today I'm abolishing altogether stamp duty on shares traded on growth markets such as AIM. In parts of Europe, they're introducing a financial transaction tax. Here in Britain, we're getting rid of one. And from April next year, this will directly benefit hundreds of medium-sized UK firms, lowering their cost of capital and supporting jobs and growth across the UK. Mr Deputy Speaker, we also set out to compete the world with the world in our headline rate of corporation tax. In Germany, the corporate tax rate is 29%. In France, it's 33%. In the United States, it's 40%. Here in Britain, we've cut corporation tax from the 28% we inherited to 21% next year. But I want to go further. And today, I want us to send a message to anyone who wants to invest here, to create jobs here, that Britain is open for business. So in April 2015, we will reduce the main rate of corporation tax by another 1%. Yeah. Britain will have a 20% rate of corporation tax, the lowest business tax of any major economy in the world. Yeah. That's a tax cut for jobs and growth. We will have achieved in one parliament, in these difficult times, the largest reduction in the burden of corporation tax in our nation's history. And with it, we will achieve major simplification of our business tax system. By merging the small company and main rates at 20p, 
we will abolish the complex marginal relief calculations between them and give Britain a single rate of corporation tax for the first time since 1973. Yeah. And as with previous reductions in the corporate tax rate, I do not intend to pass the benefit on to the banking sector, so I will offset this reduction by increasing the bank levy rate next year to 0.142 per cent. Mr Deputy Speaker, Britain is moving to low and competitive taxes. But we should also insist that people and business pay those taxes, not aggressively avoid them or evade them. And that's the right way to succeed in the global race. Under Labour, we had the worst of both worlds, uncompetitive tax rates that weren't paid. When the 50p rate was introduced, tax revenues fell by billions of pounds as the wealthy paid less. That's the wrong way round. Under this government, the tax rates are more competitive and the wealthy pay more tax. That's the right way round. Here's an inconvenient truth for the other side. In every year of this Parliament, the rich will pay a greater proportion of income tax revenues than in any one of the 13 years of the last Labour government. And during those 13 years, too many people were allowed to get away with aggressive tax avoidance and abuse. They boasted that they were paying less tax than their cleaners, and the members opposite lauded them for it. We've stopped that, and that is what I call fair. Today I'm unveiling one of the largest ever packages of tax avoidance and evasion measures presented at a budget. The details are set out in the Red Book, and they include agreements with the Isle of Man, Guernsey and Jersey to bring in over a billion pounds of unpaid taxes, new rules to stop the abuse of partnership rules, corporate tax losses and offshore employment intermediaries. That's another two billion pounds. This year we're giving Britain its first ever general anti-abuse rule and we will name and shame the promoters of tax avoidance schemes. My message to those who make a living advising other people how to aggressively avoid their taxes is this. This government is not going to let you get away with it. <laughs> and this year we are leading international action on tax avoidance through our presidency of the G8 and with the OECD and the G20. We want the global rules governing the taxation of multinational firms to be updated from the 1920s when they were first written and made relevant to the global internet economy of the 21st century. This is the right and fair thing to do. Mr Deputy Speaker, a tax system where people and businesses pay what is expected of them is part of the glue that holds our society together. So too is the expectation those, that those who work hard, who play by the rules, who save for their future and try to be independent of the state are not undermined but supported. So to the working parents struggling with the cost of childcare and the mother wondering whether it makes financial sense to get a job, we offer this tax-free childcare. The plans were set out yesterday. New tax-free childcare vouchers for working families 20% off the first £6,000 of your childcare costs for each child. <laughs> and increased childcare support for those low-income families on universal credit. And for those who aspire to put aside money for their retirement, we offer this, a simple flat-rate pension, accessible to everyone and worth £144 a year. Any £1 you save will be a pound you can keep. We're bringing forward the introduction of the new single-tier pension to 2016. It will help the low-paid, the self-employed and millions of women most of all. <clears throat> of course, if there's no longer the old state second pension, there's no longer anything to contract out of. For employers, that means paying the same employer national insurance as those without defined benefit schemes. Private sector employers can adjust their pension benefits to accommodate the extra cost. Public sector employers will have to absorb the burden, as is always the case with tax changes. Any spending review in the next Parliament will, of course, take the £3.3 billion cost into account. And we've already made clear public sector employees and the relatively small number of private sector employees in defined benefit schemes will, from 2016, pay more national insurance than they do today. 
so they will pay the same rate of national insurance as the rest of the working population, and in return they will get a larger state pension than before. For example, someone who is 40 years old when the single-tier pension is introduced and who has always been contracted out will pay an extra £6,000 in national insurance over the rest of their working life and in return get an extra £24,000 in state pension over the course of their retirement. That's a fair deal and it's a progressive pension reform. We've also made clear before that the extra £1.6 billion raised and employee national insurance will not be kept by the Treasury. Mr Deputy Speaker, there's another group of savers I want to talk about today. I'm proud to have been part of a government that has helped compensate the policyholders of equitable life who have suffered a great injustice. But we've not extended help to those who bought their with profits annuity before 1992. Now we can. I'd like to acknowledge the work of my honourable friend for Harrow East on behalf of these people. We will, <coughs> we will make ex gratia payments of £5,000 to those elderly policyholders and we'll make an extra £5,000 available to those on the lowest incomes who are on pension credit. We're not doing this because we're legally obliged to. We're doing it because, quite simply, it's the right thing to do. Helping with aspiration also means helping those who want to keep their homes instead of having to sell it to pay off the costs of social care. That's what our new cap will deliver, as Andrew Dilnot recommended. It also comes in in 2016. It will be set to protect savings above £72,000 and will raise the threshold for the means test on residential care from just over £23,000 to £118,000 that year too. For decades, politicians have talked to doing something for savers and those who have to sell their homes to pay for care, and yet nothing has been done until this week. Yeah. <laughs> and I want to do much more. For unless we fire up the aspirations of the British people, like the fires of ambition within our nation, we are going to be outsmarted, outcompeted, and outperformed by others in the world who are prepared to work harder for success than we are. So this budget makes a new offer to our aspiration nation. And what symbolises that more than the desire to own your own home? Today I can announce help to buy. The deposits demanded for a mortgage these days have put home ownership beyond the great majority who can't turn to their parents for a contribution. <clears throat> and that's not just a blow to the most human of aspirations. It's a setback to social mobility and it's been hard on the construction industry too. This budget proposes to put that right and put it right in a dramatic way. Help to buy has two components. First, we're going to commit three and a half billion pounds of capital spending over the next three years to shared equity loans. <clears throat> From the beginning of next month, we will offer an equity loan worth up to 20% of the value of a new built home to anyone looking to move up the housing ladder. You put down a 5% deposit from your savings and the government will loan you a further 20%. The loan is interest-free for the first five years. It is repaid when the home is sold. Previous help was only available to those who were first-time buyers and who had family incomes below £60,000. Now help is available to all buyers of newly built homes on all incomes, available to anyone looking to get on or move up the housing ladder. And the only constraint will be that the home can't be worth more than £600,000, but this covers well over 90% of all homes. It's a great deal for home buyers. It's a great support to home builders. And because it's a financial transaction, with the taxpayer making an investment and getting a return, it won't hit our deficit. The second part of Help to Buy is even bolder and has not been seen before in this country. We're going to help families who want a mortgage for any home they're buying, old or new, but who cannot begin to afford the kind of deposits being demanded today. We will offer a new mortgage guarantee. This will be available to lenders to help them provide more mortgages to people who can't afford a big deposit. Those guaranteed mortgages will be available to all homeowners subject to the usual checks on responsible lending. Using the government's balance sheet to back these higher loan-to-value mortgages, we will dramatically increase their availability. 
We have worked with some of the biggest mortgage lenders to get this right, and we are offering guarantees sufficient to support £130 billion worth of mortgages. Yeah. It will be available from the start of 2014 and run for three years, and a future government would need the agreement of the Bank of England's Financial Policy Committee if they wanted to extend it. Help to buy is a dramatic intervention to get our housing market moving. For newly built housing, government will put up a fifth of the cost. And for anyone who can afford a mortgage but can't afford a big deposit, our mortgage guarantee will help you to buy your own home. That is a good use, Mr Deputy Speaker, of this government's fiscal credibility. In the budget book, we also set out more plans for housing. Plans to build 15,000 more affordable homes, plans to increase fivefold the funds available for building for rent, and plans to extend the right to buy so more tenants can buy their own home. Mr. Deputy Speaker, people also have the aspiration to keep more of what they earn. That's a difficult aspiration for any Chancellor to help with when economic times are tough and money is short. But we're doing the hard work to reduce current spending. We've set out a tough package to raise money from tax avoiders. And that means that with this budget, we can stick to the path of deficit reduction, increase capital spending, and still find ways to help families. <laughs> Let me turn to duties. We inherited a fuel duty escalator from the previous government that would have seen above inflation increases in every year of this parliament. <laughs> We abolished the escalator, and we have now frozen fuel duty for two years. This has not been easy. The government has foregone £6 billion in revenues to date. But oil prices have risen again, family budgets are squeezed, and I hear those who want me to do more to help them get by. My honourable friend for Harlow has again spoken up for his hard-working constituents, <laughs> and he has been joined by many other honourable friends, like the member for Argyle and Butte. We have all listened to the people we represent. Today I am cancelling this September's fuel duty increase altogether. Petrol will now be 13 pence per litre cheaper than if we had not acted over these last two years to freeze fuel duty. For a Vauxhall Astro or Ford Oak Focus, that is £7 less every time you fill up. Mr Deputy Speaker, there is another duty escalator we also inherited from the previous government, the annual 2 per cent above inflation increase in alcohol. We are looking at plans to stop the biggest discounts of cheap alcohol at retailers, but responsible drinkers in our pubs should not pay the price for the problems caused by others. And The sad fact is that we have lost 10,000 pubs in the UK over the last decade. Many honourable members have raised their concerns with me, like the honourable, my honourable friend for Bristol North West, and my honourable friend for Burton in particular, has been a committed champion of the famous brewing industry that employs many of his constituents. I intend to maintain the planned rise for all alcohol duties, with the exception of beer. <laughs> we will now scrap the beer duty escalator altogether. Instead of the three pence rise in beer duty tax planned for this year by the previous government, I am cancelling it altogether. That's the freeze people have been campaigning for. But I'm going to go one step further and I'm going to cut beer duty by one pence. We're taking a penny off the pint. The cut will take effect this Sunday night and I expect it to be passed on in full to customers. All other duties will remain as previously announced. Mr Deputy, Speaker, Mr Deputy Speaker, of course, freezing petrol duty and cutting beer duty will not transform the finances of any family, but it helps a little to have some bills that aren't going up. And it order, order. Can I just say to the bike row and a couple of people in particular that the panto season isn't for another nine months, and if auditions do take place, can they take place outside the chamber? <laughs> Mr Deputy Speaker, it helps a lot to be able to keep more of the money you earn before you pay tax on it. <coughs> this government supports people who work hard and want to get on. When we came to office, the personal income tax allowance stood at under £6,500. 
In two weeks' time, the allowance will reach £9,440, with the largest cash increase in its history. Yeah. 24 million taxpayers will see their income tax bill cut by an extra £200. Over two million of the lowest paid will be taken out of tax altogether. In this budget, the government reconfirms its commitment to raising the personal allowance to £10,000. In fact, we go one better. Mr Deputy Speaker, we said we would raise the personal allowance to £10,000 by the end of the Parliament. Today, I can confirm we will get there next year. Yeah. From 2014. Mr Deputy Speaker, from 2014, there will be no income tax at all on the first £10,000 of your salary. £10,000 of tax-free earning. That's £700 less in tax for working families than when this government came to office. Almost three million of the lowest paid will pay no income tax at all. It is a historic achievement for this government and for hard-working families across the country. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, I am aware that the concept of a ten-pence tax rate has caused problems for honourable members opposite. <laughs> First, they introduced it before deciding that introducing it was a mistake and it ought to be abolished. Then they decided that abolishing it was a mistake and they ought to introduce it again. So to put them out of their misery, we're going to turn their 10 pence band into a zero pence band and they don't have to worry about it anymore. Every person who was paying at the 10 pence rate that they doubled will now be paying no income tax at all. Mr Deputy Speaker, there is one final tax change I want to tell the House about, and it's about jobs. For in the end, aspiration is about living in a country where people can get jobs and fulfil their dreams. The ending of contracting out that I talked about generates extra employee national insurance revenues for the Exchequer, and I want to put those revenues to good use. I want to support jobs and the small businesses that create them. And I want to do it with a reforming tax cut. In fact, it's the largest tax cut in this budget. The cost of employing people is a burden on small firms, and it's a real barrier to taking an extra person on. To help create jobs and back small businesses in this country, I am today creating the Employment Allowance. The Employment Allowance will work by taking the first £2,000 off the Employer National Insurance Bill of every company. It is a tax off jobs. It's worth up to £2,000 for every business in the country. And it will mean that 450,000 small businesses, one third of all employers in the country, will pay no jobs tax at all. For the person who set up their own business, who's thinking about taking on their first employee, a huge barrier will be removed. They can hire someone on £22,000 a year or four people on the minimum wage and pay no jobs tax. 98% of the benefit of this employment allowance will go to SMEs. It will be a, a come available in April next year, once the legislation has passed, and will also make it available to charities and community sports clubs. The last government's answer to Britain's economic problems was to propose a tax on jobs. Yeah. We stopped that, and today this government is taking tax off jobs. Yeah. <laughs> Mr Deputy Speaker, a new employment allowance that helps small firms, a 20% rate of corporation tax, a £10,000 personal allowance, major achievements delivered by this government in difficult times. We understand that the way to restore our economic prosperity is to energise the aspirations of the British people. If you want to own your own home, if you want help with your childcare bills, if you want to start your own business or give someone a job, if you want to save for your retirement and leave your home to your children, if you want to work hard and get on, we are on your side. This is a budget. This is a budget that doesn't duck our nation's problems. It confronts them head on. It's a budget for an aspiration nation. It's a budget that wants to be prosperous, solvent and free. Thank you. I commend it to the House.